Congressman, good afternoon. How are you? Good, Alan. How you doing? Sorry, a few minutes late. Had a committee hearing running a little long. Oh, so. you know what? G- business of government should never trump my show. <laughs> <laughs> And just wish that the government was actually doing something worthwhile. So, <laughs> well, I know I, I, you know, we always try to ahead of time give you a sense of you know which direction we're going. Of course, you're very good on your feet. Um, I didn't send this uh, ahead of time, but I think you sh- you should be able to deal with it. It's my first hour topic. Did you get a chance to see some of the now concrete breaking news from last night of just how badly the Fulton County election supervisor and the Fulton County election counts were here in Georgia? in terms of fraudulent numbers? I mean, I've picked up a little bit. I mean, we've been following what's been going on there, but I did pick up a little bit of uh, Tucker Carlson, what he said about it last night, and uh, uh, some of the uh, what AJC was reporting with the duplication of ballots that were being counted. I find this to be troubling that the Biden administration intentionally goes to Pennsylvania to put on a speech where they, where he uses every amount of, uh, ounce of hyperbole, exaggeration, and fear mongering to say how all of these states that are trying to tighten the security around their elections, not limit who can legally vote, but trying to prevent cheating. He goes to Pennsylvania, which is also looking to audit because they were one of those key yep. states. He doesn't like Georgia. We lost the All-Star game because no one bothered to read the law. Arizona's being fought. In fact, the Department of Justice saying, we're going to use every ounce of effort we have to fight every chance to audit the vote. Why, if this was, according to eight months ago, the headlines, the greatest, cleanest, most pure, fraud-free election we've ever had? Right, And, and this is the thing. The fact that they're out there talking about it is to me more evidence there's something there they don't want you to look at you know don't look at the man behind the curtain okay it's just there because we know it's there it, it every action that they're taking when georgia came out with its voting law which ironically uh the all-star game was the lowest watched all-star game in history i mean that ought to tell you something where the american people are they moved it from georgia because of the voting law and they moved it to a state who has less access to ballots than georgia does under the new law Mm -hmm. this is so politically driven and here's the thing that gets me i'm told quite often that because i still question the 2020 election and i still support the audits and i support trying to find you know where where things did not go right and get the answers to them that somehow I'm an enemy to our country. How dare I question the authority when they tell me it's okay? So my response, I was asked this by a CNN reporter just a few months ago, about two months ago. So, you know, why do you continue to perpetuate this lie? I said, well, there's no lie. We're questioning it, right? She mm-hmm. said, well, yes, but you're, 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 aren't you an enemy to democracy by doing this? And I said, well, you know, I recall when I was in the military, we were in the middle of a Cold War fighting against a nation, the Soviet Union, to where if you even questioned authority, you would end up in jail. America was built differently. It is our responsibility and duty as citizens to question authority. Thomas Jefferson said, where the people fear the government, there's tyranny. When the government fears the people, there's liberty. We are. It is part of our constitutional responsibility to question the authority, not just take what they say, lock, stock, and barrel, and go on. Now, what I asked a CNN reporter, I said, so why was it okay for Stacey Abrams, who has still not conceded the 2018 <laughs> gubernatorial election, why is it okay for her to claim fraud in that election, Maxine Waters and Nancy Pelosi, for four years claimed that Trump was an illegitimate president because of a fraudulent election. Why is it okay for them to make those claims? But when we have claims with thousands of affidavits sworn under oath of irregularities, if we even question that, somehow we're enemy of democracy. That CNN reporter looked at me and said, I never thought of it that way. (laughs) But never ran the cliff either, by the way. How's this for a microcosm? You've got... Texas Democrats called to a special election. Their job 
as nobody told them to run for Congress. They wanted to run to represent their districts, their constituents. They're in the minority. They don't like that they can't force the way they want election laws to work in Texas. They feel like it's being forced on them. So what do they do? Run to Washington, D.C. and say, let's force all the states to do elections the way we want. Yeah, exactly. And this is the thing is they're in violation of their oath of office. They're in violation of state law. They will be arrested when they get back to Texas. Now, they're not going to be arrested to be thrown in jail. They're going to be arrested and brought to the House floor so they will do the job that they swore to their their people they were going to do. If you don't like it, vote against it. But what they're doing is holding up a representative republic because they can't get a quorum because they don't like it. And so they're taking their ball and going home. And, I mean, they're, they're literally acting like middle school children. Mm-hmm. Probably middle school children um, actually probably act a little more mature than what we're seeing out of Democrats. I mean, nationwide. They don't like what's going on. They, they have shown how they can manipulate things, and they don't like it that others are trying to correct it. If there was truly nothing wrong with the election, why are you so upset when people uh, like Georgia and the legislature is simply putting into play Ways that will make it even harder to uh, to cheat in an election. What what is wrong with that? You know, polling if, if shows. Was, so well. I'm sorry. So I'm sorry. I cut you off. No, I just say if if this election was with such integrity, then why are you against even making it better? Right. Uh, you know what I was going to say is polling has shown. Even across liberal Democrats who were polled this question, should there be a voter ID to secure your vote? Even the, the that's the lowest category. The liberal self-identified liberal Democrat still fifty nine percent said, "Yeah, you should probably have some way of proving you are who you are." This is, I think, yeah. a losing topic for Democrats to try to win over this idea of nationalizing the election process. Now, ironically, that poll came out the day before we had a committee hearing. I'm on the House Administration Committee, which oversees federal elections. And we were, um, we were having a committee hearing on uh, election integrity, and it was all they were still trashing Georgia's uh, election law. And um, I was able to get the, uh, the uh, former attorney general from the Obama administration who in his opening statement trashed voter ID. I mean, in his written statement that he provided earlier, he was totally opposed to voter ID. I brought up that poll, and I asked him directly, so has this changed your mind? Do you or do you not support voter ID when the majority of Democrats even support it, and 87% of Americans do? He said, well, I do support voter ID. I just don't support restrictions on what kind of ID you can use. <laughs> Which, All right. He went on to talk about college student IDs. Now, how secure are college student IDs? They give them to foreign students that come in, right? So right. it's like, well, we'll go on the record saying, yes, we, uh, we do support that, but we don't want any limits on what the type of ID is. So I guess if you just want to print out an ID at, at you know uh, an office supply store, then that should be okay. Well, let me ask this as because as I want to hit a couple of other topics. And by the way, folks, if you're just tuning into the Eric Erickson Show, we've got U.S. Congressman Barry Loudermilk joining us, chatting about all of this voter ID, voter integrity, all of the work that states have done to try to prevent voter fraud. Because Congressman, we know that last year was an odd year, and we know that a lot of secretaries of states around the nation, a lot of even counties or cities put voting rules in place without going through the legislature, you can't look at those things that people did, quote, illegally and say, because you're getting rid of what they did illegally, that you're somehow restricting the vote, right? Right. Well, I mean, when when any, any governmental body or non-governmental body other than the state legislature makes any change to the electoral system, it is unconstitutional and illegal. Yeah, and the the story. The Constitution is clear. It says that only state legislatures can make any change to the the time, place, and manner. It's the time, place, and manner 
of elections. Now, Congress has a secondary role, which is only to be used in extreme circumstances, according to Alexander Hamilton talking about in, uh, in The Federalist, that the primary is the state legislatures, no one else, not a secretary of state. Secretary of State can't decide just to send out applications to every registered voter for an absentee ballot, nor change the signature requirement. That can only be done by the state legislature. We had instances in Pennsylvania where the courts were changing it, secretaries of state were changing it, governors were changing it, and even outside groups were changing election law. I mean, in Georgia, there was no provision for ballot drop boxes. All of a sudden, we see ballot drop boxes. Why? Because the state elections board decided we'll allow election drop boxes. They are not the state legislature. Mm -hmm. And the Constitution doesn't say that the state legislatures can delegate that authority. So this was the reason why many of us objected to the counting of the Electoral College. I came out with a, a press release just a few days before the count, and it was on that basis that there were changes made to Georgia's election law that wasn't, was not done by the Secretary of State, and there were so many allegations which included sworn affidavits that had gone unanswered about irregularities, lack of uh, uh, chain of custody. I mean, the list went on. I had 600 affidavits in a notebook in front of me. Those, those allegations weren't answered, and I had several in the legislature, in Georgia legislature, say, look, we can't be sure that the electors will truly represent what the will of the people were because of these problems. And so the majority of those who objected to the Electoral College count on January the 6th was because of the constitutionality of it, of all of these states that made changes, ad hoc changes, without the state legislatures taking action was unconstitutional. All right. We have to take a break. I know I think I've got you for one more segment you're going to be able to hold for just a few more sure. minutes, right? All right, we are here. Absolutely. We're here with U.S. Congressman Barry Loudermilk. I'm Alan Sanders, filling in for Eric, who will be back on Monday. Let's go ahead and take a time out. We come back. I want to chat about the difference between the First Amendment as it relates to private companies, but then what happens when that private company is being told by the White House what to do. Welcome back, everybody. Alan Sanders filling in. I've got with me returning for a few more minutes. We've got about five minutes till the bottom of the hour. U.S. Congressman Barry Loudermilk. And, uh, Congressman, I know you have a reverence, uh, as do I, for the Constitution. I, I, I think, like me, I, I call myself, everybody goes, like, what are you, a Republican? I'm like, I don't go by labels. <laughs> if anything, I'm a constitutionalist. If it says we can do it in that document, I'm okay with it. And if it's not there, then where are you reading it? That's how I look at the Constitution. Yep. I get in this discussion about social media, and I have for a while, and there's always been this little tickle in the back of my head that, that was trying to figure out how to explain why censoring social media bothered me. And so many of my libertarian and constitutional friends said, well, it's a private company. They can choose. You don't like it? Don't use it. But now, and I'm going to read you an actual message from today's uh, press conference from Jen Psaki, the press secretary for the president, saying, quote, we are in regular touch with the social media platforms about COVID-19 related misinformation. We're flagging problematic posts for Facebook. Congressman, is this the backdoor way of the government infringing on the First Amendment? This is one of the most troubling things that I have heard coming out of the Democrats and especially the White House that I can remember. I mean, this, when you have... Government-controlled media, which we know that the, the mainstream media has been uh, basically the communications department for the liberal Democrat Party. That's, that's no, I mean, they're not hiding it anymore. We saw it through the Trump administration, misinformation coming out. Um, but now when the White House is basically saying, hey, we're telling Facebook what can and cannot be said, this is the type of thing that has happened continuously through, his, continuously through history in communist and fascist states. I mean, if, if you want to see this being played out right now, all you have to do is look to the east, to China. If any media says anything outside of what the government blesses it to say, it's shut down. If you look in the Soviet Union, in Russia, the same thing has happened over there. It, it, this happened in Germany in the 1930s, where the government started telling the media what they can and how to say things. This is a precursor to that. This is, I mean, this is 
one of the most shocking things I heard recently was uh, Secretary Becerra from the uh, Health and Human Services Department saying it is our it, it is our responsibility and our authority to go and find out who's vaccinated and who's not and tell you you have to be vaccinated. No, it's not. Look, and the thing about the Constitution, the Constitution is a document that limits government power. It isn't one that grants the power. It sets up the structure of the government. And I've said this to my colleagues on the other side of the aisle. Many, this document is a restriction on your power. Oh, no, it isn't. I said, well, if that's the case, why does the First Amendment begin with Congress shall make no law? Right. <laughs> okay, that's pretty restrictive, right? <laughs> hey, all they have to do is go back. Barack Obama, before he ever ran, once said, we should rethink the Bill of Rights because it's a negative document. It tells government what it can't do. We should re-envision it to what it can do. No, that was crafted no. <laughs> intentionally to limit government. If you study our founders, what did they fear more than anything? The very government they were creating. That's why they gave it limited powers. But yet we've expanded and expanded it. And now it, the government is basically deciding it's going to be, it's going to dictate the culture in the society. And this is the great battle that we're having right now. And look, I'm, I, social media to me is socialist media at this point. That Facebook is not standing up and saying, look, we don't take orders from you. We're a private company. We're going to support the First Amendment rights of the people who are using our platform. But they have run from that over and over again. They're willing to censor anyone on the conservative side. It's happened to me on Facebook. Congressman, they'll throttle back my post. I've got, they, I've got less they, than a minute. Take their, I've got less than a minute. I want to ask you this. Okay. If this is a true, if we've got them on the record, and we know, and we've seen the redacted emails even with Fauci contacting the, the CEO of Facebook, I mean, I don't want to use the word impeachment likely, lightly, but if you are intentionally subverting the First Amendment, isn't that an impeachable offense? If, if it goes to the, the level of a high crime or misdemeanor, yes, it very well could be. And because if you're trying to purposely circumvent the rights of uh, of Americans, then we have to take a serious look at that. Congressman, and, you know, we need to take a look at Facebook for going along with it, too. Right. Especially since we see how much misinformation they said last year was misinformation. They came back this year and went, whoops, sorry, our yeah. bad. Congressman, I am out of time. Thank you so much for joining us here on The Eric Erickson Show.